to share my screen. We are in the middle of Perak, or we started Perak Chet. And um, Perak Chet is the sort of the internal debate between the Chacham and the Yerel, and the Yerel Lukim. We saw in Perak Zion, in chapter 7, the words of the, the Chacham who kind of threw at everybody a, a, a piece of his philosophy, namely that uh, life's experiences are such that we should not try to, uh, to, to sort of accept the flaws of the world as they are, including the flaw of uh, righteous, lack of righteousness and the flaw of death. Actually, I'm going to turn my mic over. Can you all hear me properly? I'm just going to switch mics one second. Okay, you should still hear me, but just might be a little bit better. Okay. And then the Ereo Lakim responded in chapter 8, with, in, sorry, in the end of chapter 7, with a, a kind of a, a, a um, methodological rejection of the Chacham, where the Ereo Lakim said, Chachma, based on personal experience, doesn't necessarily lead one to a, uh, a value-based or a spiritual-based uh, understanding of the world, and he compared it to the um, to the world of Mishle, which we're not going to redo right now. And then we have this kind of internal debate between the Chacham and the Yerei Elohim, that's where we left off last week, where the Chacham begins, Mi Kia Chacham, who is like the wise man, Mi Yodeh Pesha Dabar, who knows the the interpretation of matters of the world, adam ta'ir panava oz panav young man, a man's face shines wisdom, and uh, to which the Ereel Akim, and I'm going to I'm going to ch- translate this differently. Uh, the Ereel Akim says, in answer to the question, Mikia Chacham, who is like the wise man, the Ereel Akim kind of jumps in, grabs the microphone, and says, Ani, I am, I have more to say than the wise man does, and therefore he continues from here, keep the king's commandment, keep the, uh, the, the, the oath of God, don't be hasty to run away from God, don't persist in an evil matter, God will eventually do whatever God wishes to do, the king's word is supreme. What can you say that uh, to, to him? Shomer mitzvah lo davara. Whoever keeps the commandments shall not know a uh, harm. The eight mishpat yada lev chacham. A wise heart uh, will know the time of judgment, or will be known at the time of judgment. Ki lechol chayfetz yesh et umishpat. For every matter there is a time and a judgment. Kira'at hadam rabala. For man's wickedness is heavy, is great. Ki eneni yodem ashiyeh, ki kasheyeh mi yagidlo. Man doesn't know what will be, for he who can tell him what will be in the future. En adam shalit baruach, lichloat aruach. Man has no power over the spirit to contain the spirit. For en shulton biyom amavat, he has no power over the spirit. Over the day of death, there is no uh, peace delegation in a time of war. Wickedness shall not, uh, uh, wickedness, um, the, the wicked shall not escape its master. All this I have seen, how man has overpowered man to his own detriment. Indeed, I see the wicked buried and still walking amongst us. Out of our holy place they come. Forgotten in the city all that they have done. Because sentence is not carried out against the evil quickly. Therefore, man's heart is set to do evil. 
sinner can commit a crime a hundred times and lives a long life. And the way we understood these verses is that there's a dialogue. We have the Chacham, we have the Ebe Elokim, and now we have the Chacham, and now we're back to the Ebe Elokim. Ki agam yodeh ani ashe yetov li Ebe Elokim ashe yetov li Ebe It will be good for the man of God who fears God. V'tov lo yiyelav asha, good will not be the, the fate of the wicked. V'lo yiyarich yimim katsel, he will not have long life. Asher l'nenu yiyelav milifnei Elokim. And Pasuk Yudal, it already takes us into a different world where Yesh Hevel, and that is neither the Chacham nor the Yerbeya Lakim. So I want to come back to where we left off, which is essentially a read of this text and understanding that we're dealing with an internal debate dialogue over two fundamental issues. One is obedience to the, uh, to the word of the king, to the word of God. And it's clear that the Melech here is a reference to God, because in the one sentence he says, Pi Melech Shemor Valdibrach Shvat Elokim. So you have a identification there, uh, and to the question of the role of mishpat, the role of, uh, of judgment, and how it plays out in, uh, in our lives. So let's come back to the first half of this text and zero in on the words of the Yere Elohim. Uh, to do that, I want to pick up on threads that we have seen in the words of the Yerei Elohim in the past. Remember that the Yerei Elohim spoke to us in chapter 5. It's the last time we saw the Yerei Elohim. Actually, let's do a quick display of the text on the screen. Um, back in chapter 5, we saw a uh, similar language to the Yerei Elohim that he says here. Um, for example, Alti uh, panav telech. Right? Do not be hasty to run from his presence. In chapter 5, he used the, whoops, chapter 5, al tevehel al picha, don't be hasty or rash with your mouth. So similar language, al tevehel, al tevehel, right? There's, it's it's, a, it's a, um, uh, using the same words, but for a different interpretation. There too, he spoke about not speaking against God or obedience. Shemor uh, the the, the the Yerel Akim back in chapter 5 began with the statement, You should guard your steps, you should listen, you should obey rather than speak. And in our chapter, he also speaks about obedience, about keeping the divat shvuat alukim, the words of the uh, the oath of the of, of God. Uh, he, there, he talked about the neder, Back in chapter four, five, if you take a nether, make sure that you pay it. Although he had a somewhat ambivalent attitude towards the role of the oath of the nether, better not to take an oath at all. Whereas in our chapter, he seems to take a more positive approach to the notion of an oath, where he talks about observing the law of the king and the words of the oath of God, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, here he talks about the God's word, or the king's word is supreme. Who are you to tell God what to do? Similarly to the sentiment back in chapter 4, uh, where, where in chapter 5, where he talked about let your words be few because God is in the heavens and you are on earth, therefore do not be hasty with your mouth. Um, he, in chapter 4, sorry, in chapter 5, he talked about mishpat, etu mishpat. Uh, he used the word chefetz, et and mishpat, all terms that are similar to the um, concepts or the language of the Nenatan back in chapter 3. He says, If you see oppression, do not be dismayed because there is a hierarchy working together, both man and God in partnership. And they will eventually bring all evil to justice. Similarly, we have a sentiment here. Right? For every matter, there is a time and there is a judgment. And there is uh, judgment upon this world. And we have a reference to a hierarchy, although I'm going to leave that for now, 
because Pasuket talks about a hierarchy of man over man, whereas in chapter four, in chapter five, he was talking about a hierarchy of God and man in partnership. So it's a little bit Pasuket kind of um, and uh, Pasuket, I should say, um, is somewhat ambiguous. So we'll leave that for now. So what I did was I charted this all out for you. And in the source page, that I, this part of it we went through last week, uh, in the source page, I've given you a kind of a chart of four major themes that work through the words of the Ereol Akim in chapter 5 and the words of the Ereol Akim in chapter 8. And you can compare them. Uh, the trans, I've, I've given you the themes in English. The Hebrew I have left for um, in Hebrew, but you can see it in the translation text, uh, either in your Tanakh or online. Uh, but first, of course, is the issue of obedience. In chapter 5, the Yerel Akim, nobody's going to speak about obedience before God more than the Yerel Akim. And so he says, if you take an oath before God, make sure you pay it. Make sure you are uh, hearing his words, obeying his words. Shmorag lechal, don't uh, be hasty with your mouth. Kashirti do nedel alakim, don't, don't be hasty, pay it. And he talked about a, not critiquing God. Similarly, in chapter 8, he talks about guard the words of the king and the oath of, the, of God. And in chapter 4 and in chapter 8, he talks about obedience and not criticizing God. God's word, the king's word, is, is, is law. Who's going to tell God what to do? How can you He said in chapter 5. There is definitely reference to judgment. In chapter 5, he talks about the partnership that will address all matters of reward and punishment and punishing evil in this world. And in chapter 8, he talks about similar language. For all matters, there is a time and there is a judgment. For man's evil is great. The hierarchy is a little bit more of a tricky piece because I'm going to, we'll talk about Pasuk Tet in a minute, or towards the end of the year today, I hope. Uh, but certainly he talks in chapter 5 about a hierarchy of man and God in partnership. And in chapter 8, he seems to talk about the negativity of man ruling over man, a hierarchy in society that can lead to uh, evils in the world, for which there needs to be accountability, which is essentially where the Yerel Akim is coming from. There is, however, if we took just take a look at the beginning of this reference to obedience and, and the oath, uh, there are differences between the words of the Yerel Akim in chapter 5 and the words here in chapter 8. For example, let's just take a, as, as one example an attitude towards uh, towards an oath. Okay, attitude towards oaths. In chapter 5, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that the oath was a kind of hubris that a person should take an oath and claim <clears throat> that he is uh, uh, in control of the world. We talked about the Amal, right? The Amel who is toiling and trying to change the world and trying to critique the world and trying to make it a better place. And the Ereol Akim's words in chapter 5 were directed at the Amel, in which he says to him, stop taking so many oaths. Stop thinking that, saying that you can do better than anybody else, that you are in charge of this world. Stop criticizing everyone, including God. Right? He was talking specifically to the Amel. And when the Amel said that responsibility for this world and for accountability for the tear of the oppressed rests on the shoulders of society, upon the shoulders of the Melech, the Amel came and said, not so fast. There is somebody on top of the Melech. There is a hierarchy. There is justice. There is judgment in this world. But it's hierarchical. There is a sense of partnership between man and God. All of that was said, articulated towards the Amel. Whereas in chapter 8, he's not talking to the Amel anymore. He's talking to the Chacham. And suddenly he says, there is an oath that you are obligated to follow. 
whereas he was negative on the nether, he seems to be absolute downright mandated, mandatory with regards to the shavua. Now, of course, there's a fundamental difference, right? The nether is something we take upon ourselves. There's an element of baltosif in the nether. There's an element of, of a violation of adding to the Torah. I'm ta- saying here are the laws of the Torah. They're not enough. I'm making taking upon myself an extra oath because the laws that exist aren't sufficient to bring me to my spiritual goal. I'm going to take upon myself an extra nether. And so the Yerel Kim says that in and of itself, what was the language, we, what was the Gemara that we, that we compared it to? The Gemara says that somebody who builds, a, it takes an oath, it's like they built themselves their own altar. And if, even if they fulfill that oath, it's no better than building yourself an altar and bringing sacrifices on that altar, because which is prohibited, because you're, the hubris that you think you can do better than God is really quite uh, is is astounding, and that's the core of the argument between the Amel Lakim and the Amel back in chapter five. So in chapter eight, it's a whole different issue. Here he's talking about obedience, same obedience to the law of God. The Shavua here, the oath, it's not an oath we take, but it's Shavuat Elokim. It's the oath that God mandates us in. Right, that oath is we call that the mitzvot of the Torah. Right? Those are the oaths that he says, guard the words of the king, guard the, the oaths of God. Why does he call the mitzvot of the Torah, the the melech, the, the words of the king, why does he call them oaths? So I will bring to you, I remind you of the uh, sentiment that appears in the Gemara in Nidarim that says that if a person takes an oath, minayin shenishba'in, if a person takes an oath, and that oath is not a new oath or to do something that's not required of him, or, or but it's an oath to fulfill a mitzvah. A person takes upon themselves an oath to learn a certain uh, a number of, of uh, Mishnayas or pages of Gemara or go to a number of Shiurim. A person takes an oath to do something which is inherently a mitzvah. That, says the Gemara, is very positive. I've taken and I have sworn and I will confirm it to observe your or your laws of righteousness. But says the Gemara, What are you talking about? How can you take an oath to fulfill a mitzvah? You are already obligated to fulfill that mitzvah because you are all under an oath from Mount Sinai. We took upon ourselves an oath when we accepted the Torah. That oath was called Nasa Vinishma. We are the, this expression in the Gemara appears many times. Mushba omed Mahar Sinai. We are already obligated in the oath of the Torah from Har Sinai. To which the Gemara says, yes, but what he's doing is a person is allowed to add an oath that enables them to motivate themselves, that obligates them in a certain self-motivation to fulfill the very laws that we are already obligated in. That's the difference between Shvuat Elokim and the Neder. The Neder is to do something new. That's the Amel. Amel comes along and he says, I'm going to change the world. That's a Neder. Who are you to change the world? God set the world in place. Whereas the Yerei Elokim, who partners with God, starts from the perspective of the mitzvot of the Torah and says, you want to take, you want to follow an oath? We have an oath. Shvuat Elokim. The Rambam similarly makes this kind of statement. Uh, the, the Rambam quotes the Gemara that I referenced earlier. If a person takes an oath, a vow is considered to have built an altar. If he transgresses that vow, he should annul the vow. That's why Kol Nidre is the beginning of Yom Kippur. But We're talking about if a person takes upon themselves a neder that has a involving making something also that was otherwise permissible. But if a person takes a vow with regards to a mitzvah, something with regards to something which is kadosh, then that is a, a something which is positive. Right, that's something which is positive to fulfill. And so that's more or less where we come back to in the text, where he starts with this declaration. Uh, and 
keep the laws of the commandments, keep the mitzvot. He's talking to the Chacham. And in the, with regards to the Chacham, he says, right, there's, a, there's an oath to God. So what exactly is he referring to and why is this relevant to his answer to the Chacham? I understand comparing his words to Perak Hey and his words to the Neder of the Amel. What is the concept here with regards to the Chacham to which he says, keep the commandments and the oath of God to what is he referring? And this is really where the story of the Yerei Olakim and the Chacham and their debate begins. So here's where all this is kind of a quick review of where we were. And now we're starting with Pasuk Dalet. Um, you know, even before I get there, um, there's one more distinction between the... Let's let's talk about how this is an answer to the Chacham. Let's deal with this question first. Who is like the wise man, says the Chacham, says the Yireh Lakim, Ani, I am Pim Melech Shmo. Guard the words of the king. So, I think to some extent it comes back to a little bit of what we talked about before, which is the difference between the Chochmah of the Yireh Lakim and the Chochmah of the Chacham. What is the foundation of the wisdom of the Chacham? Based on chapter 7 of the previous parak that we learned before and 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 his and the Yerel gives response to it. Remember, he rejected it, but he rejected it because it was compared to the Isha Zarav Mishlei. Right? The words of the Chacham is essentially a, a wisdom that's based on personal experience. Personal experience, you laboratory of life, you study, you analyze, you look at the world, come to its conclusions. Those conclusions can be right, those conclusions can be wrong, those conclusions can be moral, those conclusions can be immoral. But at the end of the day, the behavior that one perf- fulfills is dependent upon the personal experience of the person who is doing the analysis and presenting the material. Hence, the Chacham's philosophy was one of don't be too righteous and don't be too wicked. Because if it's based on pure personal experience, then, says the Yerel Akim, it can lead one to very dangerous conclusions. Whereas the Chacham, the Yerel Akim of Tehillim, sorry, of Kohelet, um, so that's the real of of, uh, of of the Chacham of uh, Kohelet, if you will. Whereas the real Akim of Kohelet, which is the same kind of philosophy as uh, as uh, Tehillim, uh, starts with the perspective of Yirat Alakim, Yirat Hashem. You have to start from a recognition that the words of God are Pimelech, they are decrees of the king. They are oaths of God. We took upon ourselves that oath when we stood at Hasinai. And therefore, they are unconditional. They're absolute. We don't have the authority to say, you know what? Don't be too righteous. Don't be too wicked. Experience tells me that this is not worthwhile. What do you mean experience tells you? We're talking about a law of the king that goes beyond experience. And so right from the outset, his immediate response to the Chacham is to reject a approach to life which is subjective to one's own understanding. That's what the Chacham is. Who's like me, right? The wise man. I, I know everything because my experience is what I learned from. And the Yerelechim says, yes, but there's something beyond that experience. It's called Imelech. It's called Shvat Elokim. And so even if I don't understand it, even if I don't un- relate to it, even if I don't grasp it in my mind, but there is a decree element. There's a melch. There's a gzirat melech element in that decree. I don't know if I've shared with you in the past, but the, the the notion that we are, on the one hand, obligated to try to understand the world, but on the other hand, we are first commanded to obey pimelach shmor, and then we can get into the question of understanding. Right, yirat Hashem. 
kodemet lechokma, that this notion that reverence of God comes before an attempt to understand God, we say this every day. And if not every day, and certainly every week, because it stands at the core of one of the most beautiful piyutim written, namely the piyut of Enkilokeinu. People in Israel daven on a daily basis say it every day. So we say it every Shabbos. But the piyut of Enkilokeinu expresses exactly this sentiment. How? Very simple. What does Enkilokeinu say? I put it here in the text so you can see it. What does Enkilokeinu say? Enkilokeinu says two things. It asks a question and it offers an answer. The question is, who is like a God? Who is like our master? Who is like a king? Who is like our savior? The answer is, there's none like our God. There's none like our master. But the sequence is, first, we make the statement, and then we start the quest. This is backwards. Shouldn't we ask the question and then answer it? But that's exactly what Kohelet is saying. This is Shuat, shuat Elokim. This is Pimelech. So therefore, Mik Enke Elokeinu comes first. That's Malkeinu. That's Adonenu. God is our master. God is our king. And there's an obedience to God that's absolute before we have an answer to the question. If we put the question first and we're saying, if I have an answer, I'll obey. If I don't have an answer, I'll reject. That's the Chacham. Says the Yerei Elokim, no. Start with the absolute. And then ask the question. By the way, while we're here, just an observation that Enkilokeinu is built, it's always after the Tefillah, after Musaf. Enkilokeinu is essentially an acronym for Amen, for Bracha. Enkilokeinu, Mikalokeinu, Nodalokeinu is the acronym Amen. And then the next two sentences is our Baruch Elokeinu and Atahu Elokeinu, which is the Bracha. So not only I have Baruch Ata Hashem, Amen, but I have it backwards. I have Amen first, and then Baruch Ata Hashem, which is exactly the same sentiment as the first two sentences. I have a declaration of belief, of faith, of absolute commitment, Ein Kelokeinu, followed by the question, not the Lelokeinu. It's as if I say Amen to the Bracha before I even know what the Bracha is. That's essentially how what the Tefillah of Enkilokeinu is about. I just thought that would throw that. It's just a, a fascinating observation. I learned that it appears in uh, Sefer on Tefillah called the Lama Tefillot uh, by Elias a monk. Uh, but I thought it was very appropriate here because that's exactly what he's saying to the to the Chacham. The condition is absolute. We are committed to our relationship with God. Ani pimelach shmor not based on human experience, but based on an absolute commitment that goes above the human experience. But then the questioning or the human experience is not, is not even relevant because we already have the answer. It's relevant in the domain of Talmud Torah, but it's not relevant. How? In... how, how? If, if already I have, we have to follow as it is without... Right. Even... Questioning we have to how follow it, it even if I don't, in other words, we have to follow it even if I don't understand it. But I, I can always learn, I can always grow. But if I if I ask the question first, it's as if I'm saying that if I, unless I get an answer, I'm not going to follow the law. But if I have the answer first and then I ask the question, I already have. So what's the value of the question? And not, the answer is just, I have the commitment first. Nasa, it's the same principle as Nasa Vanishma. Right. Right? I have the commitment first. Then I can learn all my whole life I can spend learning. And some things I'll understand, some things I won't. But I have to start with that commitment. That's exactly the principle of Nasa and Nishma. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was about to see that. Right. Okay. So now let's move on. Pasukim. Ein alti behemi panav telech. Don't be hasty to try to leave God's presence. Don't persist in an evil thing. Whatever God desires, you will do. That word, or is a term we've seen throughout Sefer Kohelet. 
But this phrase, alti behelmi panafte lech, is very powerful. Do not be hasty to try to run from his presence. Why not? Meaning, what does it mean? It means alti behel, don't be hasty to attempt to run from God's presence, mi panavte lech. Altamod betavara, don't stand in a matter of the evil, meaning don't persist in doing that, that which is wrong. Why not? Because alti behel, mi panavte lech, because there's nowhere to run to, there's nowhere to hide. There's an accountability before God that is absolute. There's nowhere you can hide from God. You can't say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go into some sort of nook and cranny where nobody can see me, where God doesn't see, and there I'm going to do what I want. You know, it's like the old joke about uh, the, 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 the Kiddush and Shul where somebody uh, put a, uh, a uh, pile of apples at one end of the table and said, uh, take only one, God is watching. And at the other end of the table, there was a pile of cookies. So some kid walks up and he put up a sign and he said, take as many as you want. God is watching the apples. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work, it says Kohelet. You, you stand in God's presence. If you really understand that you stand in God's presence, then there's no one to nowhere to escape to. Now, in and of itself, that notion that there's nowhere to escape to and therefore one should be constantly, right? This notion that we live in the awareness of God, that God is constantly aware of everything we do, that is both a, uh, to borrow the phrase, a threat and a promise, right? That is both a positive and a negative. And it's used throughout Tanakh as a reference to both a positive and a negative. Meaning, give an example, and I put the example on the source page, um, in two places in Tanakh, we, uh, two other places in Tanakh, we find this as a kind of a major theme. One is in Tehillim and the other is in Eov, with very different connotations. Let's start from Eov, actually, just because I want to start from the negative and move to the positive. Eov is one of those moments where he complains exactly about this fact that God, there's nowhere to escape from. And why is there nowhere to escape from, says Eov? Because God made me, he fashioned me, Yadecha Itzvuni. He, God has made, you made me, you fashioned me, you turned me around, uh, and, you'll, and to destroy me. I, I remember that I, I made you out of clay. I made you, I formed you in the womb. I formed you out of dust. I poured you like milk. I curdled you like cheese. I clothed you with skin and flesh and knit you together with bones and sinews. I'm reading out of the English just because it'll save us a little bit of time. Right? You've granted me life and favor and your providence has preserved my spirit. These things have you hidden in your heart? And I know that this is with you. If I sin, why is it that you have formed me, create me, and therefore know every little nuance of every sinew and vein in my bones and in my flesh? It's because if I sin, you mark me and will not acquit me for my iniquity. If I'm wicked, if I'm righteous, doesn't matter. I can't escape you. There's nowhere I can go where I can hide from you, says you. And therefore, if I do, so, why is it that you remind me that you created every nook, every uh, uh, piece of flesh and bone and sinew in my body? If my head is lifted up proudly, you hunt me like a lion and work against me. You renew your witnesses against me. You increase your indignation against me. You bring me fresh armies against me. In other words, why, why did you bring me out of the womb? So that every little piece of information that I do, every time I misstep, every time I say something out of line, every time I walk out of line, you know every ounce of me and therefore will hold me accountable. So to eel of the fact that God formed me, fashioned me, turned me, and created me, poured my body and spirit into me, right, is a source for his complaint that God has done all this in order to mark him, hunt him. To say, I know everything, and therefore I will, every, I can accord. You know, what's the expression? Everything you say in a, a canon will be held against you in a court of law. 
says, that's how we live through life. Everything we say, God will hold against us in a court of law. That's Eo. Tehillim says the same thing, but from the exact opposite perspective. Achor v'kedem tzartani, you formed me, created me, forwards and backwards. V'tashet alai kapecha, you laid your hand upon me. Pli'ad da'at mimeni, such knowledge is, escapes me. Niskava lo'ochala, I cannot attain it. Ana elech meluchecha, where can I go, where can I run from your spirit? Where can I escape from you? It's exactly the same sentence we just read in Kohelet. If I run up to the heavens, there you are. If I try to make my bed in the grave, there you are. Whether in the heavens or in the grave. I'll go up to the heavens, there you are. In the, against the sea, I will, I will run, there you are. Right? Therefore what? Therefore, the conclusion is, Chakreni el v'da levavi. Search me, God, and know my heart. B'chaneni v'da sa'apai. Test me. Know my thoughts. Ure'eim derech otzebi. See if there's any wicked in me. Unecheni b'derech olam. And lead me in the way of the everlasting. In other words, Eov, and t- these two chapters in Tehillim and Eov, essentially reflect the same idea that we live in a world in which because God created the world and because I believe that God created me, I recognize that God knows everything there is to know about me. What's the conclusion? To Eov's conclusion is that's a threat. That's a threat. God knows everything about me. I can't escape. To Hillam, it's a source of inspiration. God knows everything about me, and therefore God can lead me, God can guide me, God can understand me, God can be tolerant of me, right? Search my heart, know what's in my heart. Two very different perspectives from the same phenomena. Kohelet similarly makes the observation, you cannot escape God. Al tibayel mi panav telech. For the conclusion of Al Tamod B'davara, don't persist in an evil thing, because God knows everything. What is the context of that conclusion in Kohelet, right? In, in Tehillim, God knows everything, and therefore He knows my thoughts, He can guide me back in Tshuva. In Eov, God knows everything, and therefore He knows how to th- hold everything I do against me in a court of law. Kohelet applies that principle to two additional contexts. Number one, and he's going to say it in the next Pasuk, there is no escaping God on the day of death. And the Yerei Elohim is going to address the question of mortality head on. And there's no escaping judgment before God at the moment of death. And those are the two principles that you, the Yerel Hakim is going to elaborate on from this point forward. Al tibar mi panav telech, don't be hasty to run from his presence. Al tamod b'davara, kol sheyachbots yaseh, ba'asher dvar melech shulton, for God's word is master, supreme. Umi yomar lo mataseh, who is going to say to God, or to the king, what are you doing? Shomer mitzvah lo yedatavara, who keeps the commandment shall not come to harm. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The eight umishpat yedalev chacham. The wise, the one who understands, the one who is wise in this regard, will know the time and a judgment. Ki lechol chefetz yish eight umishpat, ki ve'at ha'adam rabahalav. We'll come back to that. Ki enen yedem ma she ki kishe ye, kashe ye, Miyagidlo, it's part of that same sentiment we'll come back to, and we came to Pasukhat. Ein adam shalit baruch lichlo ataruch. Man cannot power, have power over the spirit. Lichlo ataruch, cannot contain the spirit. Meaning, man has no power over the spirit of life. He has no ability to control when he is born and when he dies. Nichloa Taruach. 
ואין שלטון ביום המוות, very famous phrase, there is no authority or power over the day of death. But in the Medrash, they talk about the Malach HaMavas, right? There's no authority over the, over the angel of death. But essentially, it comes to the same idea, that we are limited. And we, have, we think we live in a world in which we have total control. We think we live in a world in which we live our lives with, with absolute certainty of what's going to come tomorrow. The one thing we have absolutely no control over is who lives, who dies, when we live, and when we die. I'll explain that phrase in a minute. There is no delegation in, the de- in war. And therefore, evil will not escape its master. So what's he referring to here? What does it mean, Ruh? Excuse me? No, I was wondering what Ruach means. What, uh, like, Ruach is the same... In, in, or does it mean the wind and he cannot no, control no, no. the wind? Ruach in this context is the same as we saw in the Yerei Lakim for sure. Uh, we say it at the end of Kohelet. Uh, that the dust, the man returns to the dust as it were from where he comes. The Yerei Lakim, the Ruach is the Ruach of, of life. And that's exactly his point. You can't contain the Ruach because there is a point in which we have no control. Even a Melech, even a king, an earthly king, has no the most powerful despot in the world, the most powerful king in the world, has no ability to overcome the principle of mortality. Right? I think and, that, and that's, uh, that's, I think that the... it's a very true statement and a very powerful one. Right? We think of, especially in our youth, we think that we're going to live forever. We make plans as if we're going to live forever. Says Kohelet, and remember, he's talking as a king. We, we have no power over, over our lives. What is a Mishlachat ben Mulchama? So Mishlachat is a, uh, a peace delegation. And once there is no more powerful moment of death than a experience of war, where who lives and who dies is, is, seems almost random. Angel is an example of We have no control. Which means that if I come back to the sentiment of uh, um and with which he began, don't think you can escape God, right? There's nowhere to escape, therefore you live your life as, as because right? don't persist in the evil thing, right? Is because you live in a world in which you can meet your maker at any point. Go from Pasuk Dalet to Pasuk Hey, there is Eitu Mishpat to Pasuk Chet, and you understand. Ein Adam Shalit Baruch. The the most powerful what's the what's the expression? There's no atheist in a foxhole. You come to war and you see death all around you, and you understand that you the most powerful person in the world recognizes that they are not in control, and that ultimately there is a power above them. You know, we have an interesting uh to some extent that's the story of Ganadin. Right, we talked about Gan Eden at the beginning of the uh, of uh, of the Sefer. The whole issue of Gan Eden is that man is placed in a position where he takes the Olam Hazeh, he takes the world of the Eitzadat for himself, and God says, "Okay, well now you lose the Eitzachayim, now you lose the tree of life." Why? Because if for a moment consider the fact, right? What's the pasuk? Adam haya achad mimenu Now that man thinks that he is like God. E- controlling, mastering the world of good and evil, meaning this world, then if he takes of the Eitzachayim and he lives forever, then what will happen? He'll never come to the point at which he recognizes but, mortality, okay. recognizes God is more powerful than he. How many people, for how many people is their lifeline to spirituality moments of, of death? Funerals, Shiva, Kaddish, Yizkor. 
How many people does their only lifeline to Jewish life and existence is those moments where they realize mortality is more powerful than they are? That, that's exactly the point. There is no way to escape mortality. There's no way to escape. And therefore, you have to recognize that uh, you have to live your life with the recognition. What does the Gemara say? The Gemara says, uh, the Mishnah in Pekiavot, that a person should live their every day of their life as if it's their last. To which they were asked by the students, what do you mean? You never know when you're going to die. So that's exactly the point. Do tshuva today, because you don't know if tomorrow you will die. But that's a, a, that's a, a, a mature perspective. How many young people take out life insurance policies? How many young people prepare for their own funerals? It's a reality that we don't. We live our lives as if we think, the younger we are, the more we're guilty of it. Right? We think we're going to live forever. The most powerful person in the world is a person with authority, with wealth, with with power. Shulton says, Mortality is inescapable. That's point number one. And therefore, prepare for it. But point number two, in the context of the book, the, the conversation here, point number two, which is no less important, is that because mortality is inescapable, what happens at the time of death? At the time of death, there is accountability. And that count accountability is inescapable. God has the authority. You do not have that authority. We have no authority over death. Only God. And therefore what happens? The two psukim in the middle. Shomer mitzvah, lo yeda davara. If you observe the commandments, then you will not know an uh, evil thing. Ve'et um mishpat yeda lev chacham. Et um mishpat is exactly the term we've seen from the very beginning of the Sefer as a reference to accountability before God. Kilu chol chepetich, et um mishpat. How do you tell the hostages that? I, I'm not dealing with individual cases. We're dealing with with broad. We don't tell the hostages that broad, because we I have will, no idea why God did that. Hang on a second. Hang on. I, I'm not getting into why God does what. I'm talking about bigado. We'll talk about how to put it all together. But it's the same theological question about righteous who suffer, and he's not addressing that issue here at all. What he is saying is that at the point of death, every person has a moment in which they are standing before the Creator and held accountable for good and for evil. That's all he says. Ki lechol chayfetzi sheish tu mishpat. Ki ra'at, for, for the very reason, ki ra'at hadam abalaf, a man's evil is, is great. Kohelet is one of the only books in all of Tanakh to address the question of what happens to us as we leave this world? It's interesting. No other book in Tanakh does. No other book in Tanakh addresses the question of reward and punishment to the next world. They all deal with the question of, on a national scale, on a broad scale, if we observe the mitzvot, there's a relationship with God, the land of Israel, the people of Israel, Kriyat Shema, read it, right? That's the, that's the relationship. Kohelet is the only address to the question of Individual accountability before God. Lo yimalet resha et ba'alav, says Kohelet. Wick, the wicked will, lo yimalet resha et ba'alav. The evil will not spare the master, or evil will not, the, the master will not escape. The master of evil, or the one who perpetrates evil, will not escape that moment in which they stand before God, and God will hold them accountable. Ki l'chol chayfetz yesh etu mishpat. It's interesting, Tehillim said the same thing. Tehillim, with the passage that I just read in Tehillim, also said that uh, there is a sense of accountability before God. 
but from the perspective of the, the process by which a person is put into this world, because God created me, because God formed me, because God knows every part of the mind of the human being and the body and the soul and the temptations and the, right? Because literally from the womb, there is no escaping God. Therefore, it's a matter of, of guiding me, testing me and, and inspiring me. To Kohelet, it's the exact opposite. Kohelet, the process by which we recognize that we are not going to escape our accountability before God, isn't the process by which we are born, but rather the process by which we end our time in this world. Ein shilton mavet. That's the cycle. We start in the womb, we end in the grave. And along the journey, we accompany certain points, right? We At the end, we stand before God before we are put into this world, and we stand before God after we leave this world. And we are asked, what did we do in our lives and in our time that we were here? It's exactly what the passage describes, which fascinates me because it's it's a uniquely rabbinic perspective, meaning Chazal talk about this all the time. Chazal talk about the notion of Alam Abba, of the world to come, as a time of judgment, as a, as a place in which we stand before God and we are held accountable for all our actions and our lives are 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 replayed for us, etc. Right? That, that we talk about that all the time, but not in Tanakh. Tanakh doesn't deal with that subject. Because Tanakh is the subject of the Jewish history, Jewish people, nation, land. And in that context, the, the operative terms of Tanakh are the status of the breach of the God, with, between God and Israel. Kohelet changes that equation and says, wait a second, let's look at this for a moment from the perspective of, is there an accountability before God after one leaves this world? The righteous who suffer, the, 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 the wicked who prosper, says the Yerei Elohim, there is. When? When one leaves this world. Now, somebody asks, somebody should ask the question, but didn't wasn't the Yerei Elohim the one who said, back in chapter 5, that accountability is not in the next world, but accountability before God is in this world? Remember that? Who was it who said that accountability before God is in the next world? Who was it who said that even if there's evil in this world, God will hold everything and will sort it all out in the world to come. What was the expression? The righteous and the wicked, God will judge. For there is a time and accountability before everything there in that world. Who was it who said that? Wasn't the Arei Elohim? Sounds very spiritual, but it wasn't the Arei Elohim. The Amal. It was it, almost. It was the Nanatan. Oh. Amal said some. The Amal rejected it. The Amal. The, the, the Amal said, "If that's true, then what's the purpose of living in this world if there's no accountability?" The Nanatan's perspective was: "Lecholzman ve'et lecholchevitz tach dashmayim." There's a time, and God runs this world. And if God runs this world, ultimately God will hold mankind accountable for evil in the next world. Where? Sham, in that world. To which, back in chapter 4, the Amel said, well, if that's true, then there's no point in living through this world because we have we can't change it, we can't do anything with it. Came along the Arayel Akim in chapter 5, and the Yerei Elohim said, Im oshek rash mishpat If you see oppression, if you see the vi- violence, if you see the absence of judgment and justice, if you see all that in the world, don't worry. Why? The Nenatan said God is in charge, and the Amal, Imel said man is in charge, and I, says the Yerei Elohim, say, Gikavo me'al gavo'a shomer. 
because accountability is a partnership between man and God. Let the king do his half, and the God will do his half, and together they'll figure it. They'll, they'll sort it all out. Right. So the back in chapter five, the Elohim said nothing about the next world. He talked about the Beit Hamikdash, and he talked about the Malach. He talked about the partnership that may, that maintains law and order here. Suddenly, the Elohim is talking about. Right? For everything, there is a time and a judgment. When and where? You can't escape God. The day of death. And at that moment, man shall not escape his wickedness. So is judgment in the next world or is judgment in this world? And the answer is, the answer is both. The answer is both. The Yerel Akim, the answer is both. That's exactly right. And that's what's going to get the, the Chacham is reje- reaction. Okay, so to the somebody who asked me the question before about this, uh, about, what about all the righteous who suffer? Right, and we're going to see exactly how the Chacham is going to respond to that. But that's right now where the Ereel Akim is at. It throws in the question of the existence of, ju- of death as a motivation for living your life now in a manner in which you are aware that you will one day have to meet your maker. And therefore, Shomer Mitzvah Le'edadabra, therefore keep the commandments, therefore, Eitu Mishpat Yedalev Chacham, you are smart if you recognize that there will be a time and a judgment. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we had a kind of a summary, and we summarized all of the various perspectives on death. The Nenatan who tried to ignore death. The Amel who tried to conquer, destroy death, uh, create immortality through longevity, through their themselves and their heirs and their achievements, and and three-prong chord, generation after generation, society, the king, right? Then we had the Chacham who tried to kind of uh, accept the reality of death as a equalizer in life. And therefore, since there's nothing past death, the goal here is to death is the ultimate mistake, says the Yechacham, and you can't correct it, and therefore kind of live a life of mediocrity because there's nothing beyond. Now we have the fourth piece of the puzzle, which is the Ereo Lekim. Because whereas the Nenatan tried to ignore death and the Amel tried to conquer death, the Chacham recognizes that death exists, but he says, learn to live with it. The Ereo Lekim says, what do you mean learn to live with it? i got a much more important value for us to live by, which is to recognize that there is a, that the soul is immortal. And therefore, we return to God. And so learn to take this moment in life and inspire through it and learn to live a higher value or a higher kind of life with it. Precisely because the, uh, the, the soul, the, the body returns to the earth, but the spirit returns to God, says Kohelet in chapter 12. Right? Kohelet is the only sefer who, who articulates it in that, far, in, in that context. The dust returns to the, to the earth as it was, but the spirit returns to God. That's the real Elohim. And that's where the sense of the mishpat comes in, right? That there's going to be an accountability before God. Which brings us to Pasuk Tet. And we've run out of time. So, here's the challenge. Now you're going to have to come back next week. Here's the challenge. Pasuk Tet sets up the challenge which is that there is a recognition that we live in a world in which man rules over man to his own detriment. 
Shalat Adam Badam Levalo. There is evil in this world. How do I deal with that evil? So I have an answer from the Chacham. If the if sorry, I have an answer for the from the Yerei Elokim. If these are the words of the Yerei Elokim, and I have an answer from the Chacham. If these are the words of the Chacham. But this is your turning point in the book. This is the point in which he says, "But wait a second. What about all those people?" who don't live their lives by the sense, the reality, the awareness that they're going to, they live under the watchful eye of God, and they don't live their lives by a righteous code. They live their lives by right makes by might makes right and control and overpowering and evil. Liralo. What do you do with them? And tell me that God will sort it all out, doesn't help. Because that's not going to motivate them to change. I tell somebody who lives his whole life by the uh, power of, of, of the sword that uh, one day they're going to meet their maker and they're going to look at you in the face and say, what are you talking about? So this is the turning point in this in the text. And what comes next is the internal debate between the Chacham and the Re'elokim about this question of the wicked who does the... Is, is there justice in this world? Is there a sense of accountability in this world for our actions? That's the rest of this parak. We will sort it out as well to Shem next week. Lots of questions in the chat, so I'm going to save the chat because I didn't have a chance to look at it. Um, and I will come back to this. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, please. When somebody raises a hand, like there is a way in Zoom to raise a hand, like this. Yes, okay. Do I, I don't like always that? see it. I don't always see it. Sometimes I see it on the side of my eye and I catch it. But I don't always see it because I, I've got two screens, so I have to see it out of the peripher out of my peripheral vision. So I apologize if I missed a, okay. a raised hand. Thank you. But did you have a question? I had a side conversation with a lady, and oh. uh, that is uh, my resulting question from that. Got it. Okay. Um, Thanks. No problem. All right, let me actually stop sharing. I can see you out of on my main screen. Okay, so we will stop here. Uh, we have a lot to unpack, but this uh, we've sort of reached the end, the last piece of this discussion, which will not take us long to get through in terms of the text. And then uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, unit next week. So next week will kind of be a... Uh, some loose ends from this week, and then we'll move on to the next piece as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you My very pleasure. much. Thank you, Rabbi. My pleasure. Have a great week. Stay you well. Too.